Hello. In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. The story isn't over. You and the audience are part of the conflict. The Second Amendment to the Constitution, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. Governor Heston, a lot of people would say they fail to understand your views on guns, for instance, your promotion of the National well, Rifle Association. Well, Americans certainly shouldn't fail to see that. Uh, because it's the Second Amendment of our Bill of Rights, which is a, an utterly unique document. No other government in the world has it. And they had it because those wise old dead white guys that invented the United States had witnessed one of the first acts of General Howe when the, they saw the revolution, the Americans really were going to revolt, was to go through as many houses as they could and take away the firearms. But the Second Amendment doesn't imply unrestricted gun ownership, does it? Yes, it does. That's disputed. That's heavily disputed, well, isn't it? Well, it's mistakenly disputed. Well, can I, can I just... I can, well, I, go ahead. Can I just quote you the words of a Supreme Court Justice, mm -hmm. Lewis Powell, who said, with respect to handguns, it's not easy to understand why the Second Amendment or the notion of liberty should be viewed as creating a right to own and carry a weapon that contributes so directly to the shocking numbers of murders in the U.S. Contributes so directly to the shocking numbers of murders in the U.S.? Um, with due respect to Chief uh, Justice Powell, or Justice Powell, uh, I don't think he has the iconic stature of, say, Thomas Jefferson, who said, when they were drawing up the papers for the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights, he said, it is the aim that every man bear a gun. Patrick Henry, uh, Richard Henry Lee, uh, Madison, all, uh, it's on the record. It's on the very record, but it's, but it's disputed, isn't it, by, by plenty well, by of less, people? By less intelligent men than those. You, you realize those were giants. I mean, they... Do you think Mr. Justice Powell would argue with Thomas Jefferson or James Madison or Patrick Henry? A free people ought not only to be armed and disciplined, but they should have sufficient arms and ammunition to maintain a status of independence from any who might attempt to abuse them which would include their own government. George Washington. Are we at last brought to such a humiliating and debasing degradation that we cannot be trusted with arms for our own defense? Patrick Henry. The Constitution shall never be construed to authorize Congress to prevent the people of the United States, who are peaceable citizens, from keeping their own arms. Samuel Adams. The right of citizens to bear arms is just one more guarantee against arbitrary government one more safeguard against the tyranny which now appears remote in America, but which historically has proved to be always possible. Hubert Humphrey, 1960. When governments fear the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. The strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is as a last resort to protect themselves against tyranny in government. Thomas Jefferson. The best we can hope for concerning the people at large is that they be properly armed. Alexander Hamilton. The very atmosphere of firearms anywhere and everywhere restrains evil interference. They deserve a place of honor with all that is good. George Washington. Arms discourage and keep the invader and plunderer in awe and preserve order in the world as well as property. Horrid mischief would ensue were the law-abiding deprived of the use of them. Thomas Paine. To preserve liberty, it is essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms and be taught alike, especially when young, how to use them. Richard Henry Lee, 1778. A free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as a gift of their chief magistrate, Thomas Jefferson. Guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel. Unfortunately, nothing will preserve it but downright force. Wherever you give up that force, you are ruined. The great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able might have a gun. Patrick Henry. That's what our founders believed, and that's what's important because that's why we have a Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, as all of our Bill of Rights, all of our Ten Amendments, are designed to limit what the federal government can do. 
And that includes the Second Amendment, ensuring the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Right, but as you know, the Second Amendment specifically applies to a well-regulated militia. I ask, sir, what is the militia? It is the whole people. Who is the militia? Are they not ourselves? To disarm the people, that is the best and most effective way to enslave them. George Mason. Congress have no power to disarm the militia. Their swords and every other terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. Tench Cox, 17. And increasingly, the courts are agreeing that individuals were to own their own military rifles so that if they were called to duty, they would have that to bring with them. That was the Militia Act of 1796, which required all able-bodied men to own a military rifle so that they would have it at the ready where they called up. Do you think every American should have an AR-15? Uh, every American should be able to get an AR-15. I understand there are plenty of people that are not going to want that. There are probably people that would rather have a superior firearm. Uh, that's their choice. What are you going to do if President Obama wins his battle and brings in new uh, stricter gun control legislation? Well, he's not going to do it by legislative, in my opinion. What I'm concerned about, and what I've been concerned about since even well before the elections, is having seen the president rule by executive order where he has no authority in other areas, I can see that he would just go ahead, and, and the vice president has even hinted at an executive order that would accomplish some or all of their uh, gun control agenda. That, I think, uh, changes the game and throws into question the legitimacy of the federal government. And I would advise Mr. Obama to consider what happened to George III when he was doing similar things against the American colonists. You're likening President Obama to George III. Well, he ha President Obama hasn't banned the importation of ball and powder yet, which George III did. Uh, but that was one of the major contributory elements to our war for independence. And George III, as you probably know, uh, was so stressed by the loss of his uh, uh, famous uh, favorite colony that he ended his days in a nut house. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Can you just give us an overview of the situation in Britain today? Uh, it is with sadness, shame and sorrow I'm forced to tell you that Britain is a long, long way from the land which I believed I was fighting for 68 years ago. Um, we are not only suffering oppression from corrupt politicians, crooked judges and bent coppers, but against a great many of the British people. British people, we are a, a nation of Quislings. If you don't know the name Quisling, look up in the dictionary. Third, I'm grieved me to say so, but 33% of the British people nowadays are corrupt, 33% are brainwashed, and 33% are spineless. Only 1% have a conscience and courage enough to speak out. And those 1% are all in very great danger. Of course we're all in grave danger. And our complying and groveling greases the skids for them. Texas is known for being free because my ancestors and many of your ancestors would stand up to dictators. Instead of cowering in fear. And I just don't understand this living on the knees thing. Every time I think about the innocence and the aborted children and all the evil going on, I, I just have no fear. I mean, as a man, I was born to just stand up to the tyrants. So you can car bomb me, slit my throat, poison me, whatever. I am beyond you. I am in Jesus Christ's hands forever. And if you don't believe in God, I choose justice. I choose being a good creature. Not a sneaking, stealing, murdering, nasty, fraud-driven New World Order. And I hope you'll stand with us in history for goodness, okay? Against all the cynics and all the rest of them. I hope that you will stand with us, and I hope you'll promote InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com, because I don't want to just do this halfway and get killed for nothing. I know we can change history. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, 
by the military industrial complex. The guns will be taken. No one will be able to be armed. We yes, will take all yes, weapons. Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. Just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. The Department of Homeland Security is apparently on a huge ammo buying spree. It comes out to like 1.6 billion rounds of ammunition. And as KSLA News 12 Jeff Farrell discovered, the clergy would help the government with potentially their biggest problem. Us. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole community. There will be pundits and politicians and special interest lobbyists publicly warning of a tyr tyrannical all-out assault on liberty. Not because that's true, but because they want to gin up fear. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. I order all those assembled to immediately disperse. It's a military mission in North St. Louis. Heavily armored vehicles are rolling into town. And don't be alarmed if you see those over the next seven days rolling through your neighborhood. If you see military helicopters flying low over Minneapolis, do not be alarmed. Black Hawk choppers soaring through the night sky, but this is only a drill. Heavily armed officers in Watertown search for the suspect, house to house. It's a joint military training exercise involving local police, also military. In your apartment! I am in my apartment, sir. Go back inside right now! I am inside. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. The dramatic scene played out in front of our cameras. Parents grabbing their children and running after spending the night hunkering in their houses and then finding themselves face to face with the muzzle of a SWAT officer's rifle. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. This is the heart of 1776. We're not turning our guns in and we're not running and we're not backing down. If you want to come and take them. You are tuning in, if you're a new listener, to the number one patriot, liberty, freedom, constitutionalist, pro-sovereignty, pro-America program in the world. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And you notice I didn't say conservative, because that's a term that doesn't mean anything today. As long as you're against the Democratic Party, it means you're conservative. You can be for banning guns. You can be for abortion. You can be for open borders. You can be for carbon taxes. You can be for banker bailouts. As long as you don't like the disgusting, degenerate Democratic Party, you're a conservative. Well, you know what? I don't like the disgusting Republican Party either. I am someone who wants freedom, and I'm not anybody's slave. And I know what's going on, and I'm angry about it, and I'm here to wake up my fellow humans, whether they be black, white, Hispanic, Asian, old, young, whether they be from China, whether they be from Mexico, whether they be from Canada, whether they be from Germany, whether they be from Israel, whether they be from South Africa. I don't care where you're from. You could be in Inuit up in Alaska. I want you to have freedom. I want you to live long and prosper. I want your children to have a fair shake. I know what comes around goes around. For me to be free, you got to be free. I don't like oligarchs. I don't like monopoly men. I don't like bullies. I don't like thugs. I don't like globalists trying to set up a new dark age. And I'm angry about it. And I'm not going along with it. I'm red-blooded. And the people out there that don't like it better get used to it. Because being a man and standing up for freedom is back in style. I am nothing special if we were living back in 1776. It shows how domesticated and pathetic we've gotten that I'm something special today. Because what you're hearing is Americana 110%. The people of this country don't have to be protected from the truth. This country was not built on the idea that a handful of nobles, whether located in our federal agencies in Washington, D.C., or in the news agencies in New York, to decide what was good for the people to know and what they should not know. This is a totalitarian concept, which presumes that the leaders of our federal government and the men in control of the powerful press media constitute a special elite, which by virtue of their nobility and their brilliance, empower them to think for the people. Personally, I would rather put my confidence in the common sense of the people of this country. 
to, well, Bush did this or Clinton did that. I'm not saying it's right for anybody to be doing this stuff. I don't want any of these guys to have this power because let's say the next guy is a Republican or whoever gets, who, and gets in office. Do you want him to have these same powers that you granted Obama? We are in process of developing a whole series of techniques which uh, will enable the controlling oligarchy to get people actually to love their servitude. Uh, people can be made to enjoy a state of affairs which by any decent standard they ought not to enjoy. There's a need for a new world order. Someday in the next few years, a solution will emerge. They've got the general public in a trance to the point of Gibbs now going on TV making jokes about lying to people. And see, this is sophisticated. People are like, oh, he's Mia coping. No, he's not. It's all part of a flaunting it in your face. Okay? It's all part of flaunting it in your face. One of the things, one of the first things they told me was, you're not even to acknowledge the drone program. You're not even to discuss that it exists. Wow. And so I would get a question like that, and literally, I, I couldn't tell you what major asked, because once I figured out it was about the drone right. program, <laughs> I realized I'm not supposed to talk about wow. it. And, but here's what's inherently crazy about that proposition. You're being asked a question based on reporting of a program that exists, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you're the official government spokesperson exactly. acting as if the entire program, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. But the point is, is that it's not like he was told don't admit some secret torture program, which we know Obama's continuing and has been caught doing, and then putting out zero dark 30 movies about how he's, the White House was involved in that about how he blocked the torture program, another lie. And the idea that the torture program you know, actually saved America, more lies. The name of the film should be Zero Dark Easter Bunny. But the larger issue here is that Gibbs is up there saying it's like the Wizard of Oz, the little guy behind the curtain, because the drone program is all over the foreign news. It's admitted to be going on, and that Gibbs was told to just say it doesn't exist if people brought it up to him. So it just shows the control. There is no Bilderberg, there is no drone program, there is no aspartame. Aspartame doesn't give you diabetes and cancer, even though they admit it does. And yeah, there's cancer viruses in most vaccines, but so what, dying's fun. Because we care about the children. You know, Sandy Hook, we're very upset. Ban all the guns for the 20 kids. You know, we really care, even though we say there's too many people, let's kill everybody. Here they are thinking, you're so stupid, they're talking about false flags on TV. The traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall he had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out, that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. One can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? We can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, 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 this is not a, a either-or proposition. Of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. Yeah. We, we could get nastier with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, like 9-11? Like PNAC wrote in September 20, 2000, a new Pearl Harbor event, a catastrophic terror attack, killing 3,000? They actually said 3,000. <laughs> Boy, they know what they're doing. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're not in Kansas anymore, ladies and gentlemen.
Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. All right. Nope, nope. They definitely, definitely spy on Americans. And Tim, is there any way, now obviously it was a voicemail, they could, they could try to get the, the phone companies to get that out at this point, but if it's not a voicemail, it's just a conversation. There's no way they actually could find out what happened, right, unless you tell them. No, there is a way. They, we certainly have ways in, in national security investigations to find out exactly what was said in that conversation. Um, it's not necessarily something that the FBI is going to want to present in court, but it may help lead the investigation and or lead the questioning of her. So somewhere so it's being digitized or they can actually get that. Because people were saying, look, no, that would be possible. It's pretty incredible what you're saying. No, welcome, welcome to America. The, uh, the, all of that stuff is being captured as we speak, whether we know it or like it or not. Note to self. Okay, let's turn our attention now to the phone call between Catherine Russell and her husband, Tamlin Sarnayev. You said something very interesting on Aaron Burnett's show last night. You said that if Catherine Russell does not divulge the contents of this phone call, that the FBI had other methods finding out what was said. What did you mean by that? Well, on the national security uh, side of the House, for in, the, in the federal government, you know, we have assets. There's lots of assets at our disposal throughout the intelligence community, and also not just domestically but overseas. Those assets are, allow us to gain information and intelligence on things that we can't use ordinarily in a criminal investigation but are used for major terrorism investigations or counterintelligence investigations. And you're not talking that about a voicemail, right? What are you talking about exactly? I'm talking about all digital communications are, are um, there, there's a way to, to look at digital communications in the past. Um, and I can't go into detail of how that's done or what's done, but I can tell you that no digital communication is secure. And so these communications will be found out. They will, the conversation will be known. It's all recorded. And it's just a question of whether or not Catherine Russell decides to uh, that's enough. own up to Everything said, is right. recorded since the mid-1990s with your tax money. That arrogant FBI guy all smiling. <laughs> we have assets. Yeah, we know you got assets, pal. Catherine Harris, Fox News Channel. Thanks for taking my question. Will the Utah Data Center hold the data of American citizens? No. Uh, we don't hold data on U.S. citizens. Um, you know, I think one of the things from my perspective that is grossly misreported is everybody says, so you're going to grab all the emails and you're going to stick them down, all the U.S. emails, and put them down in some place in the United States. One, we don't do that. I believe it is in the nation's best interest to put all the phone records into a lockbox that we could search when the nation needs to do it. Yes. Government tracking of phone records has been in the news lately. Is this an invasion of privacy or necessary to keep our country safe? Why or why not? I think the society that we live in today, it's sad that if we go to the movies or to the airport or even to the mall that we have to worry about our safety. So I would rather someone track my telephone messages and feel safe wherever I go. Feel safer. Than feel like they're um, encroaching on my privacy. This is why our country is in so much trouble. And the idea that a government that can listen to your phone calls isn't going to do something bad with that, you're always going to get criminal elements. And when you let them do unconstitutional things, bad things happen. I will not answer any questions or testify today. I decline to answer that question for the reasons I've already given. I will not answer any questions or testify about the subject matter of this committee's meeting. Given their power to destroy businesses and audit individuals, do you think it would be useful for the IRS to require all of its employees to take a class studying the Constitution and Bill of Rights in order to make positively sure that they understand the concept of government restraint created at our founding? Um, I think it's very important that IRS personnel be well trained. Did you study the Constitution? You're a lawyer, are you not? Or an attorney? Um, I, I went to law school. You went to law school. Did you study the Constitution? Um, I believe I took constitutional law, but I'm not prepared to uh, take an exam at this time. Trust has not been eroded or undermined, but it's been destroyed. 
that trust is gone. Uh, my constituents, the people I represent, believe the federal government is out to get them. This is just so frustrating to me. You know, the whole question here is, we've heard this from time to time, just about accountability. And in all the scandals, we hear the same thing from time after time by the government officials that are involved. Benghazi, IRS, AP reporters, fast and furious. Time after time, we're hearing people, wasn't my job, I don't know, was the other office, I was recused. I didn't find out about it until you found out about it. Where does the accountability begin? People's lives are on the line in these things overseas. People's constitutional rights are at stake here. I mean, it is just the age of the criminal. Every criminal on earth turned loose, the government recruiting them to absolutely implode and rob everyone. This is like the French Revolution, the Jacobins, the opposite of our revolution. And they're buying billions of bullets and armored vehicles and setting up checkpoints all over the place and putting the military on the street. I mean, they are just running wild. And their main drive is destroying the family, destroying men and women, destroying normalcy. The, this is a group of mentally ill deviants. What do you think the Nazis were? A bunch of deviants. What do you think the communists were? A bunch of deviants. I mean, have you read about Hitler, Mao Zedong, Stalin, Lenin? These are their own writings, the stuff they were into ultimate weirdos who don't like those of us that just want to go home to our wife and kids and be normal, that never get tired of a steak, never get tired of fishing, never get tired of a sunset, never get tired of our wives, of our husbands. We are anathema to them. They like burning cities, starving children, black uniforms, hell on earth. And I, for one, have had enough of it. I've had enough of it. And it's time for the strong and the decent and the normal to rise up. And to, and to call out the enemy and call it out for what it is. Again and again, this administration and its allies have used the resources of the government itself to intimidate or silence those who question or oppose it. I don't know about you, but I think that the leader of the free world and his advisors have better things to do than dig through other people's tax returns. A number of Tea Party groups had complained, and Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell wrote to the IRS to complain that they were being harassed. Uh, there's absolutely no targeting. Earlier this year, dozens of Tea Party-affiliated groups across the country learned what it was like to draw the attention of the speech police when they received a lengthy questionnaire from the IRS demanding, listen to this, demanding attendance lists, meetings transcripts, and donor information. Now, what they're trying to do is intimidate donors to outside groups that are critical of the administration. Uh, they've got the IRS, uh, the SEC, and other agencies uh, going after uh, contributors. The Internal Revenue Service admitted today that some of its employees targeted conservative political groups. This is outrageous no matter what political party you are. This government is using the Internal Revenue Service to target. There is a culture of intimidation throughout the administration. IRS began singling out Tea Party You groups. have any kind of conservative leaning background, affiliation, they're going to target you and come after you. This isn't speculation. They're admitting is it. Is this still America? These are the things that drive the Obama economy and they drive an ideological agenda that as we have seen again and again has little regard for those who dissent. No president from either party is more powerful than the Constitution of the United States. Today, Lerna will invoke her Fifth Amendment right and refuse to answer questions. I will not answer any questions or testify about the subject matter of this committee's meeting. Didn't know at that time. I am not aware of that. I don't know. I don't know. I have no memory of anyone doing that. I didn't know that. I'm not personally responsible. Do you believe it is illegal? I don't believe it is. Well, when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. What does the president believe? Does the president believe that would be illegal? The law here, the law is irrelevant. We're going to punish our enemies and we're going to reward our friends. friends. So the answer is start ignoring it all i mean it, i mean it really those of us that are upright and decent and good we just got to figure out ways to resist the system not go along with it pay with cash shop with small groups buy local uh don't support hollywood bad mouth them everywhere spit when you hear their names i spoke to a man called larry pratt 
He's the chairman of a powerful organization called Gun Owners of America, and I started by asking him what he made of the epidemic of gun violence in this country. I would not agree that there's an epidemic of gun violence in this country. In fact, our murder rate has been declining over the last several years, even as more people own more guns. But if you look at the murder rate, it's, I think in 2010 it was 8,775 gun-related murders in the United States versus 58 in Britain. I mean, these are glaring statistics, aren't they? Um, it, it's a different culture. We have different statistics. Uh, you have a, a higher murder rate uh, than just a gun rate, but, uh, and your violent crime rate is the, is the fourth highest in the world. But, but violent crime does not mean murder. It does not. Right. But uh, if murder. you like to live in a violent society, be my guest. The fact is, though, that the United States is the developed country in the world with the, with the highest, by far, the highest murder rate caused by gun violence. Is that not something this country should be ashamed of? This country should be proud of its uh, ability to own firearms because it's one of the things that distinguishes us from most of the rest of the world. As do the statistics. The statistical argument is not going to persuade Americans that their ability to own guns and keep the government at bay is going to be something that we're going to put on the table. When you say keep the government at bay, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and you talk about gun ownership, that sounds rather alarming. What do you mean by that? Well, it was rather alarming to George III, too, when the, uh, the colonists said, you've become a tyrant, stop it. And when he wouldn't stop, we shot. And we got rid of uh, your king. Uh, George III wasn't democratically elected by the people of America. The president of the United States is. Surely times have moved on somewhat, haven't they? Sometimes the president seems to forget that he was democratically elected. Are you saying that uh, Americans should exercise their Second Amendment rights um, to stand up against this current president? I'm saying that the president should remember George III's experience. That sounds like a warning. Of course it is. That's what the Second Amendment is. It's a warning. Isn't that kind of warning going to encourage some people to, to take a shot at the president? No. No. It's um, an encouragement to people who are already being encouraged by the president's actions and his words to go and buy firearms, especially if they haven't owned them before, which is what's happening in this country. But what you're saying is irresponsible, is it not, in a country where um, at least three presidents were killed by gunfire? I mean, if you've got a fairly high assassination rate of your leaders in this country, surely for calling, uh, you know, to stand up against the democratically elected leader of this country, you're, you're asking for trouble. It's rather irresponsible to suggest that we should allow a tyrant to have his way and the people not be able to resist. Are you calling the president a tyrant? I'm not calling the president a tyrant yet, but uh, the president certainly has indicated he has a low regard for the law and a low regard for the Constitution. He was elected by the majority of people in this country. The president was elected by a majority of the people. That does not give him a right to violate the Constitution. But he's not violating it. He, is not, he has said, I respect the Second Amendment. He's not going to do anything to get rid of the Second Amendment. You don't believe that? He says he respects the Second Amendment even while he's uh, uh, doing all he can to destroy it. But what's he done to destroy it in well, detail? He's, he's called for background checks, which he has no legal authority to do. Hang on a second. How could you possibly object to background checks if you're the kind of person who says too many guns end up in criminal hands? Background checks is only uh, one piece of many parts of a legislative package on Capitol Hill. If that's the only thing that is uh, finally enacted by one of the houses of the Congress. It'll go to a conference committee, and there that conference committee can add anything it wants. And so we are saying no gun control at all. Nothing, one word at all is acceptable. Isn't what you're arguing the equivalent of saying in the car industry in the 1970s or 80s, no seat belts, no, no speed limits, no limitations on how people use their motor vehicles, which is essentially also potentially a lethal weapon if you drive badly. You know, there's still many Americans that don't enjoy the notion that the government considers itself to be our nanny. And seat belt laws uh, are an example of a good idea being made compulsory. And, and you're against that too? I'm a, I, I wear seat belts all the time, but the idea that the government should tell me to do that? What, are they going to tell me to eat and when to go to bed? Veronique Posner, the mother of um, a six-year-old boy who was killed in Sandy Hook, talking about the prevalence of guns and 
opposition to gun control in Capitol Hill, said, and I quote, America has lost its moral compass. What do you say to her? Well, anyone who's lost a child is hurting. I lost a grandchild in a pool, uh, and that still hurts. So my heart goes out to her, uh, but that doesn't mean that I have to agree, nor can I agree, with what she's saying. I think we would lose our moral compass precisely if we gave up our right to protect ourselves. Repeal Amendment 2. The Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution, ratified in 1791, enshrines the right of individuals to keep and bear arms. So says the Roberts Supreme Court in a recent ruling. If you look at all the statistics and really uh, excellent academic studies on gun control, what it tells you is that guns are very, very effective at protecting the honest people. And so um, uh, it doesn't make any sense that you would try and strip the honest group of their protection. There's no reason why people right. should have access to assault the weapons. You don't need, the sportsmen don't need that, right. and most sportsmen no, favor no, no. regulation. When the gangbangers come, they don't come one at a time. They come and you need a machine gun to fight back these gangs. It's enough to turn your stomach. 428 AM, armed street punks bust into this home in St. Petersburg. Inside, 41-year-old Richard Shaw and his 18-year-old son. What happens next is chilling. The family surveillance camera captures screaming, the sounds of a struggle, and then a gunshot. When it's over, Shaw is dead, and the thugs run from the house after robbing the place. Just 20 minutes prior, another home invasion just blocks away. Similar suspects, similar M.O. 51-year-old homeowner Greg Gordon is struck violently in the head. You know, I have semi-automatic weapons because I live in a county where there's drug dealing. And what I believe is that drug dealing is absolutely financing the government and its black budget and is supported by the government. And if you look at the home invasions that those drug gangs occasionally do, they come in packs of three. And if I'm going to have to deal with a home invasion by a drug gang, then I want semi-automatic weapons because there's going to be three of them and one of me. I'm Sheriff David Clark, and I want to talk to you about something personal, your safety. It's no longer a spectator sport. I need you in the game. But are you ready? With officers laid off and furloughed, simply calling 911 and waiting is no longer your best option. You can beg for mercy from a violent criminal, hide under the bed, or you can fight back. But are you prepared? Consider taking a certified safety course in handling a firearm so you can defend yourself until we get there. You have a duty to protect yourself and your family. We're partners now. Can I count on you? There is such an effort to take your guns away from you. You see, the intent of the Second Amendment, the Second Article of the Constitution, was not so that we could go hunting. The intent of our forefathers in establishing the Second Article and Amendment to the Constitution was that as long as every American owned a weapon, whether they ever fired it or not, our government could never oppress us just with the knowledge that we all had that weapon in our closet. Every time you see a bill to take weapons away from the American people defeated in Congress, four more are introduced immediately. It's a never-ending battle. That's why they lie about the statistics. The truth is, in a town where everybody owns a weapon and everybody knows it, there is almost no crime. It's been a long road getting here. And a lot has changed since I got back. Now this is the center of my world. My family's safety is my highest priority. I am responsible for their protection. And 
no one has the right to tell me how to defend them. So I've chosen the most effective tool for the job. Senator Dianne Feinstein was the author of the assault weapons ban in 1994. Uh, Professor Koppel, was the 1994 assault weapons ban a sensible and effective means of reducing gun violence? Based on the Department of Justice study, the answer was no. Man, it's a big deal that we've dropped the crime rate 49% since 1991. That's the latest numbers is 91 to 2011. 20-year uh, official FBI, local numbers, very accurate, the world standard in statistics. You can say a lot about J. Edgar Hoover, but he did get statistics down. He was obsessed with it. He pretty much launched the modern science of statistics that, that actually codified off local numbers. And it's a 49 whopper. 49 whopper. I mean, criminals are scared. And, and then they say, well, you don't need semi-auto to protect yourself from criminals. And you need semi-auto. The, the robbers have semi-auto. Hey, police, if, if we don't need semi-auto to protect ourselves, we just need a double-barrel shotgun, I got an idea for you. You don't need semi-auto either. Government, you turn in all the semi-autos, and you turn in the bullets, and you turn in the armored vehicles and the drones and the body armor. I mean, what do you need that for? Because you don't need those to protect yourself uh, defensively. Of course, that's not true, actually. You need semi-auto. Auto. The criminals will always have semi-auto. And I know you know this as gun owners. The general public doesn't know it. Okay? And they're going to ban our guns. They're coming. They're going to stage more Sandy Hooks. As people understand the extent to which the goal of the administration is to take away from honest, and ci honest citizens weaponry that absolutely has been demonstrated throughout time to protect them, whether from local crime, you know, government sponsored or not, um, I, you know, I think there's a real risk here that, that they're going to awake the sleeping giant. Question. If the U.S. Constitution were being drafted today, would it be a good idea or a bad idea to exclude the Second Amendment, Tim Carney. I think we ought to exclude the first part, which adds the ambiguity, and just say the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, 1791, was drafted by James Madison, who later became our fourth president and was modeled on existing state precedents. Quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, unquote. The key concept underlying this article in the Bill of Rights is this. Individual gun ownership is a defense against tyrants, whether a monarch like King George III or a modern dictator like Adolf Hitler. You mentioned that there's some 100 pages of the bill that specify particular firearms that, that if this bill were passed, Congress would have deemed prohibited. And the Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights provides that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The term, the right of the people, when the framers included it in the Bill of Rights, they used it as a term of art. That same phrase, the right of the people, is found in the First Amendment, the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition their government for redress of grievances. It's also found in the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. None of these rights are absolute. None of them. This does not prohibit, you use the word prohibit, it exempts 2,271 weapons. Isn't Mr. that Chairman. enough for the people in the United States? M Mr. Do Chairman. they need a bazooka? Assault yeah. weapon ban is, is meaningless. The term yeah. assault weapon just means because scary looking you can't. Gun. That's exactly what this country is supposed to be armed with for our own defense under the Second Amendment. It has nothing else to do with anything. Not hunting, not collecting, nothing. And the guns we are supposed to have in our homes are the very guns that a standing army would have that exist in this country at the time we're dealing with. We're not talking about arming with bazookas or RPGs or anything like that. I really think we're facing something right now that's fundamentally different from what we've witnessed in the last 30 years. That nobody is talking about, um, you know, amending the Second Amendment or repealing it or anything like that. Something's changed.
changing in this country, and it has to do with, I think, the perception between who makes up one class of the citizenry. Let me put it this way. The white, male, Christian, conservative, gun-owning, heterosexual. That makes up a very large majority of the male population in this country. That category of individual has a long history in gun rights, in building the West, going West, individualism. It's been with us 200 years. So it's not surprising that those particular category of men have more guns than most people. That's not surprising just because it's a cultural fact. But what nobody's bothering to try to grasp is why would a separate category of the population, a category that studies, follows any violation of civil liberties called the progressive left, they've been on the leading edge of exposing every invasion of privacy, surveillance society, the use of drones on U.S. territory, search and seizure laws, any violation of the Fourth Amendment, the First Amendment. The progressive left has been on the leading edge of providing that information and saying, This is in violation of the Constitution. It must stop. But what makes them, the same people that have given us information for decades, saying that we're at the edge of a a regime, a fascist regime that's taking over the country, it's a corporate, violent regime that doesn't care about your rights, and they're the ones protesting it, saying we're coming upon a fascist state, so let's disarm the American people. Do you really understand what it is that makes the progressive left, who fights tooth and nail over every conceivable civil liberty violation that comes aboard, anything from gay marriage, they want to smoke marijuana, they want abortions, they don't want you to be able to search and seize anything, they don't want you to listen in on their emails, their text messages, all of this is being violated, every area of it, and on top of that, the left will say, all of this collectively means we're headed for a fascist state. So let's ban guns. The progressive left doesn't hate government. It doesn't hate big government. The conservative right can't stand big government, wants less government. The progressive left, as individuals, they want a seat at the table. The progressive left movement that wants to disarm America is also the movement that has stood in the foreground of protecting civil liberties for the rest of America, but not on this issue. And there's a reason why, and I think all of you need to understand it. Right-wingers can't stand big government. Left-wingers demand it. But they are in favor of big government without a particular category of people being free to participate in it as free as them. And that category of people are the ones that you'll notice it in Hollywood, you'll notice it in television, in academia, You'll notice it in different environmental groups. They really do despise how this country was founded by white Anglo-Saxon males, many of whom were Christians, very conservative in their thinking and religious. And, of course, without question, they keep and bear arms. They can condemn the founding fathers because the founding fathers aren't here to defend themselves. And they can rewrite history in deconstructionist theories any way they want. We don't pay attention to this. The problem is is they're going to win this battle. Somebody needs to say this. The progressive left is racist. It's like a club, but it's their special club, and they are bound and determined to have a seat at the corporate government table. They don't want to see government go away. They want to be part of it. They just don't want white, conservative, male, Christian gun owners part of it. And taking away your gun, taking away the guns from... That segment of society will make these people dance a little jig, do high fives. I'm telling you, there's a hatred behind what we're faced with, and we need to face it realistically as the Americans who are being targeted here. That group that I just described to you, they're not going to have a problem if there's a Waco incident in every major metropolitan area in the United States. They will be doing high fives. We've been too busy trying to say, look, I'm white, but I'm not a bigot. I'm, I'm white, but I, I, I don't have a problem with gay marriage. I'm white, but I want to keep it bare arms. Oops, not that one. All people in this gun violence debate want to do is to regulate the sale of weapons and maybe ammunition. Now, I've got Diane Feinstein. 
I've got Holder, I've got Obama, I've got Sarah Brady, I've got the quotes and video of all of them saying we want to take guns. There should not be a right to own guns. There is no Second Amendment. Remember, they used to argue that. And with no Second Amendment, Congress could pass a law as limited as this, banning assault rifles or as sweeping as prohibiting all private firearm ownership and requiring the surrender of all privately held firearms. You'd have there a could be no appeal. There would be a revolution in this country. Iowa lawmaker calls for retroactive gun ban, confiscation of semi-automatic weapons. Well, Cuomo called for that in the New York Times three weeks ago. Feinstein called for it. I, I, Iowa lawmaker calls for retroactive gun ban, confiscation of semi-automatic weapons. In an interview with the Daily Times Herald in Carroll, Iowa, State Rep Dan Mulaber, I think is how you pronounce it, said governments should start confiscating semi-automatic rifles and other firearms. And other firearms. Down to 22 rifle. We cannot have big guns out there, out here, as far as big guns that are out there. The semi-automatics and all of them. That's all of them. Mole Bauer, am I pronouncing that right? Told the newspaper during a December 19th audio tape interview. We can't have... Those running around out there, those are not hunting weapons. See, they say it's always about hunting. That's their fake argument. No, it's about defending against tyranny. We should ban those in Iowa. He then went on to say, we'll go door to door, street by street, and get them. We need to get them off the streets illegally. And even if you have them, I think we need to start taking them. We can't have those out there. And he goes on to describe how to take them door to door. If there are any folks who are out there right now, uh, who are gun owners, and you've been hearing that somehow if somebody's taking away your guns, get the facts. We're not, we're not proposing a gun registration system. We're proposing background checks for criminals. Congress has repeatedly outlawed gun registration because of the accurate recognition that in other countries and in the United States, in New York City, gun registration has been used as a tool for confiscation. In the spirit of gun control, will you disarm your entire security team? Uh, you will think, get right back to you. You'll get back to me? The U.N. has passed the treaty to take our guns. Obama's trying to implement. It's on. I predicted mass shootings six, seven months ago. Before Sandy Hook, before Aurora, because I knew they were coming. Spread the word about the broadcast. Help us get the stories out to everyone. Help expose the domestic arms buildup. Why do you want our guns while the globalist NATO, the UN, has taken control of our military and is training to take on the American people? This is treason. This is treason. There's a bullet buying spree go going on right now by the Department of Homeland Security. But the Department of Homeland Security appears to be on a buying spree. Their most recent request is for 10 million rounds of hollow point bullets for a 40 caliber pistol. Another 10 million rounds for a 9mm, plus 1.6 million pistol cartridge 9mm ball bullets. And that's just this year. Last March, DHS bought 450 million bullets, and in September, another 200 million. That's in addition to a reported 1.6 billion rounds they already have. DHS says the bullets are needed for training, but military veteran Richard Mason is doubtful. We never train with hollow points. We didn't even really see hollow points my entire four and a half years in the Marine Corps. Why would they need all those hollow points? Why would they need all those ball rounds just for training? It doesn't really make sense. And DHS to buy 360 million more rounds of hollow point ammunition, and then they say it's for target practice when you don't use hollow points in target practice. So during the height of the Iraq War, U.S. soldiers used about five and a half million rounds of ammunition every month. If you do the math here, that means the Department of Homeland Security has enough bullets to wage a full-scale war for the next 30 years. Kind of scary, man. Black helicopter crowd really is upset. And when they're going, there are no bullet purchases, there are no armored vehicles, there are no checkpoints, there are no military drills, there are no black helicopters. And you're like, well, there was a big black helicopter drill in my town. They practiced taking over the Capitol. Just in, a military drill in downtown Miami, complete with these Black Hawk helicopters, elite soldiers, and police officers swarming the streets. It's kind of scary when you suddenly look up and see that, but it's all about being prepared for the unknown of urban combat. 
mentioned, it can be quite alarming. Seven, we counted them, seven Black Hawks thundered across downtown Miami. And we're going to take a pause here so you can listen in, so you can appreciate what it sounded like to be there. in between downtown Miami buildings. And what I can tell you, what we know is that this was a joint military drill with the Department of Defense and Miami-Dade County Police. The rest, we are told, is classified. But for being a secret operation, it was certainly conducted, as you see, in such a public way, in full public view, as they made their way from downtown Miami over to Marlins Park and then roared right back. I can tell you that a similar drill was conducted on Tuesday night. I know that because I saw it firsthand. I was actually, as you watch the images from tonight, on Tuesday night, I was on the MacArthur Causeway with my husband as we saw, once again, seven Blackhawks coming toward us, heading toward the beach. And what really caught our eye is how low they were flying. I mean, they were just hovering right above the causeway. We asked all the questions you might imagine about what was conducted today, but we are told, Lori and Calvin, that all of that information cannot be released to the public. And any indication, Christina, if we'll see this again tomorrow night or through the weekend? Classified. Classified. <laughs> you know, the reason why they do that. They're practicing a civil war federal takeover, which is a global takeover. And they don't want to have a national debate about this before they nuke a major city and blame it on the Patriots. Who was the first terrorist organization in the United States? <clears throat> Who? Founding Fathers. Founding Fathers. You mean Thomas Jefferson? Oh, yeah. You mean uh, George Washington? Oh, yeah. Paul Revere? Yeah. This is the la-la land world, and you've just got to get, hey, they're demonizing us because we're the answer. You want to know why every show demonizes patriots? People that know about the New World Order, because we know what's going on. We're the people aware of the takeover. Certain guns are not for hunting. Again. Oh, nice shot. The way we've been operating here lately is, is as a dictatorship would operate, not as a representative republic. I know that the issue of gun control is hard. I know it's political. Look at that monster. I know it's controversial. Gangster wants your guns. But we are proposing today common sense measures. And I say to you, forget the extremists. I am done it's calling simple. on the... Uh... No one hunts with an assault rifle. I had a politician in yesterday, a Bob Fioretti, he's like, you know, the Second Amendment was about muskets. These people take this and they mutate it and they twist it and they make it something it isn't. This isn't about muskets and hunting. This is about having equal firepower to them. And Joe, I have in my hands here uh, something that we received from the Senate, which is rejected Democrat proposals uh, in this gun bill. And I don't know that you've seen this or if you know that these are there or not. No, but we don't have our own list of rejected proposals. Oh, that Senate rejected, so I don't have anything to show you. Okay. All right, then I won't address it then if you haven't seen it. <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. Uh, okay, thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. And uh, Mr. Speaker, on the bill. And by the way, I would recommend not to have that list shared because it really has the capacity to... Uh, uh, dampen the enthusiasm to compromise. Well, it sure does when we talk about confiscation of assault weapons. It absolutely has the ability to dampen a compromise. The Second Amendment isn't there for duck hunting. It's there to protect us from tyrannical government and street thugs. Take the women in India. Your piece earlier on CNN I was watching uh, during Anderson Cooper's show didn't tell you that the women of India have signed giant petitions to get firearms because the police can't and won't protect them. The answer well, is, hey, fine. wait a minute, I have FBI yeah. crime statistics okay. that come out a year late, 2011. 20 plus percent crime drop in the last nine years. Real violent crime because more guns means less crime. Britain took the guns 15, 16 years ago. Tripling of your overall violent crime. True, we have a higher gun violence 
uh, level, but overall mugging, stabbings, deaths. You, those men raped that woman in India to death with an iron rod four feet long. You can't ban the iron rods. The guns, the iron rods, Pierce, didn't do it. The tyrants did it. Hitler took the guns. Stalin took the guns. Mao took the guns. Fidel okay. Castro took the guns. Many... Hugo Chavez took the guns. And I'm here to tell you, 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. Doesn't matter how many lemmings you get out there on the street begging for them to have their guns taken. We will not relinquish them. Do you understand? And that's why you're going to fail, and the establishment knows no matter how much propaganda, the Republic will rise again when you attempt to take our guns. I didn't go in there and, oh, you're so big, got such a big set, you're, you're so powerful. We're not going to get this country back playing patty cake. And we're told basically to shut up and vote, and that's what this is all about. Just don't question it, just vote. That's basically the message here. If that's not dictatorial, I don't know what is. Hitler would be proud. Mussolini would be proud of what we did here. Moscow would be proud. But that's not democracy. So I, I don't even know how you question whether that's not dictatorial or not. That's absolutely dictatorial to, to send a message down. And the only thing necessary was to ram it through so that the people of New York didn't get a chance to see it. Does the, does the dawn of Chicago, Emmanuel, play nice? What about your comments of referring to the governor as uh, Hitler and Mussolini? You feel that's an appropriate thing to say? I said it was Mussolini-like. I said they'd be proud of what they'd went on. They'd be proud of what he did. Yeah. That Hitler would be proud of that, that a message of... Well, he's acting like a dictator, in my opinion. You feel that's an appropriate thing to say about I just government? said it. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're dealing with. And we're not going to get our country back playing patty cake. We're going to get it back going, we know who you are. We know foreign banks have hijacked the government. We know you're illegitimate and don't stage something. And even if something happens, giving up our rights doesn't keep us safe. So don't you blow something up and blame it on us. We're watching you. You understand that? Uh, Biden, the vice president, saying we don't need to just ban gun shows and private sales, private transfers, period. Well, that's what their bills do. You can never transfer guns, not when you die, anything. Kind of like the death taxes. Can't transfer your money when you die. They're saying can't transfer any guns, period, when you die. You go turn them in. And they want to, and, and, and don't say they won't ban guns even though they can't enforce it like the drug war. That's the whole plan is, is now to pack the prisons with gun owners and have the purges of us. Just like the Attorney General has said, we need to make it like cigarette smoking, a dirty thing. Others have said make it like us being a sex offender. And that's why they put your name out in the news when you're a gun owner when they have you registered. They want to shame you. In fact, that's a quote. He says, we want to shame people into not owning guns. Well, I mean, aren't you ashamed of having all the bodyguards and carrying a gun? You punk? You gangster? You thug who shipped 20,000 guns into Mexico to blame the Second Amendment? That came out in the, C in the CBS News. They got the memos first. I didn't need CBS News to tell me that was done to blame the Second Amendment. I had a DEA source told me about it before it even broke. Sally Castile. Oh, this bill that... I authored grew out of a hearing we were having on violence on the border of Mexico. When were you first told or became knowledgeable about U.S. officials allowing firearms to be sold to the drug cartels in Mexico? I don't know. People didn't believe when I told you two years ago Obama was shipping guns into Mexico and hand grenades to drug gangs so they could blame the Second Amendment and try to get a U.N. treaty passed so that, the, so that Mexico could sue the U.S at the UN over guns. I've also asked the school board to make a part of every day some kind of anti-violence, anti-gun message. Every day, every school, at every level. One thing that I think is clear with young people and with adults as well is that we just have to be repetitive about this. It's not enough to simply have a, a catchy ad on a Monday and then only do it every Monday. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. And it's every day you see this, saying it's time to give up on the Constitution. Well, that's nothing. Some of these shows badmouth the founders. These people are collaborators. Let's give up on the Constitution. How about you go to hell? I know. It sounds radical. I know you're a traitor. But it's really not. I know I'm a sack of crap. Constitutional disobedience is as American as apple pie. For example, most of our greatest presidents, Jefferson, Lincoln, Wilson, and both Roosevelt's, had doubts about the Constitution, 
and many of them disobeyed it when it got in their way. You see, this is the spin. Jefferson said it wasn't enough protections, and so did the others. Lincoln was the one that went absolutely hog wild and was a tyrant. It was Abraham Lincoln that arrested all of his opposition and let the army rob everything, even in the north. I mean, they use it as a power grab. Oh, man. And again, I'm not saying the South was good either. It was all manipulated by British intelligence. See, it's not one side's good, other side's bad, usually. This is the issue of this election. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. We, the people, chose to do these things together. Because we know this country cannot accomplish great things if we pursue nothing greater than our own individual ambition. Unfortunately, you've grown up hearing voices that incessantly warn of government as nothing more than some separate sinister entity that's at the root of all our problems. Some of these same vo voices also do their best to gum up the works. They'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. You should reject these voices, because what they suggest is that our brave and creative and unique experiment in self-rule is somehow just a sham with which we can't be trusted. We have never been a people who place all of our faith in government to solve our problems. We shouldn't want to. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. From time to time, we've been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule, that government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. I know some here wish that I could just bypass Congress and change the law myself. I know there's some folks who wish I could just bypass Congress. I can. Now, I know some people want me to bypass Congress and change the laws on my own. Uh, right now, dealing with Congress, the idea... There is one last uh, res uh, res uh, thing to which the people can resort if the government does not uh, respect the uh, the, the restraints that the Constitution places on the government. Abraham Lincoln talked about our, our right to uh, alter our government or a revolutionary right to overthrow it. And that is certainly something that no one wants to contemplate. But uh, as I mentioned in my, in my, in my written uh, and my delivered testimony, if the people come to believe that the government is no longer constrained by the laws, then they will conclude that neither are they. That is why this is a very, very dangerous sort of thing for the, uh, the uh, president to do, to wantonly ignore the laws uh, to try to impose obligations on people that the legislature did not approve. It's an excellent conclusion. Well, the main reason this is all happening is the general public is on party time. People want to work at their job. They want to go home and watch television and get drunk or take drugs or play video games all day. There's a mass narcissism upon the general population as well where people are just very, very shallow and very, very scared. Now, there is a large portion of people across the political spectrum who are aware, who are upset, who are informed. And if you read a Homeland Security manual, none of it has to do, and they're all public, there's new ones out this week, none of it is about Al-Qaeda, none of it is about Muslim extremists, which they set all this up on the auspices of. And I told you, I said... This is going to be for constitutionalists. This is going to be for anti-globalists because this is a globalist takeover. I know who the globalists have always targeted. I know who stands in their way. They've ratified the U.N. treaty at the U.N. Now they want the Senate to ratify it. And they're setting it up where, all right, there's one more school shooting. It's your fault. Oh, there was another school shooting. See, America wins enough enough. <gasps> And that's why Bloomberg and Feinstein and Michael Moore have all said there'll be more shootings and we're going to get your guns. And they've also bragged, the head of the Violence Policy Center, hey, we've got your kids.
they said this to me in the news, you know, in a response in the local paper in 13 years ago. They said, it doesn't matter what Mr. Jones does coming to all our rallies and bullhorning us. It doesn't matter what bribery he catches at the Capitol. It doesn't matter what he does. We've got your kids, was the quote. We've got your kids. We've got your kids. I mean, and just creepy off the chart. They want to destroy and break the human cycle forever and, 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 and then make us literally slaves. That's what slavery is, is to break up the family. That's the heart of it, because they want your allegiance to them. We have never invested as much in public education as we should have, because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. Obama's gonna change it. Obama's gonna lead them. That, my friends, is political pornography. I am just here to support the President of the United States. The President of the United States is, you know, our boss. But he's also, you know, the President and the First Lady are kind of like the mom and the dad of the country. And when your dad says something, you listen. And when you don't, it usually bites you in the ass later on. I started getting a lot of letters from kids. These are some pretty smart letters from some pretty smart young people. At least eight children have died of heat stroke in cars in the first week of August alone. 23 children in 14 states have died after overheating in cars this year alone. Eight in the first week of August. I'm writing to you to ask you to stop gun violence. Can we stop using guns? If I think if they are no guns on the street, no one could get hurt. Bullets don't have eyes. It can't hurt anyone. I am really scared of guns and criminals around the world. I love my country and I want everyone to be happy and safe. No guns, no guns, no guns, no guns. I think there should be some changes in the law with guns. It's a free country, but I recommend their needs to be a limit with guns. Please don't let people own machine guns or other powerful guns like that. I think there should be a good reason to get a gun. I think there should be a limit about how many guns a person can own. But my opinion is it should be very hard for people to buy guns. The only thing they do is harm or kill, and guns should only be used in the most horrible event where others will get hurt if they are not. I know that laws have to be passed by Congress, but I beg you to try very hard to make guns not allowed. Not just for me, but for the whole United States.
part of the Maryland Rifle Club and Maryland State Rifle Team since I was 11. We shoot semi-automatic AR-15s and um, my personal rifle is a Bushmaster. Because of this, I have become eligible for various shooting scholarships around the country to a wide array of even the most prestigious colleges that have shooting teams. Achieving stricter gun control laws would obliterate any opportunity I could have had to attend a decent college on a shooting scholarship. Ever since I first learned how to shoot, the issue with gun violence around the nation became clear. Guns are not the problem, people are. Purging our society of violence and murder cannot be done through gun, con gun control legislation. By signing this legislation, you are not signing away gun violence, but instead liberating American citizens of our constitutional rights. You are not eliminating guns from society, but eliminating our ability to protect our lives, liberty, and pursuits of happiness. Chicago, Illinois has had some of the strictest gun control laws in, in America enacted for the past few years, and it is currently more than twice as likely for you to be killed in Chicago as in the Afghani war. For the past 11 years and four months in the Afghani war, 2,166 people have been killed. Now in only eight years in Chicago, 4,265 people have been killed and 3,371 of them were from being shot. Is that really something we want to model our state laws after? Now even of those 3,371, only 37 were killed with a rifle, which is barely 1%. 98% were killed with a handgun, so creating, a gun so creating gun control legislation that targets assault rifles has statistically <coughs> proven to only weed out less than 1% of the problem if you're lucky. I'd also like to point out that none of the guns used in the Chicago shootings were registered or licensed to the people who use them, thus even further proving that simply restricting guns will not stop criminals from using them, nor will restricting guns stop criminals from harming others in general. Okay. On December 14th of 2012, the same day as the Sandy Hook shooting, in central China, a man stabbed 22 children and one adult. Guns are not needed for mass murder and robbing American citizens of our rights to own them won't solve anything. You must also consider the fact that the majority of gun violence occurs in low-income neighborhoods. Raising the overall cost of owning a gun through higher licensing and registration fees denies the ability of low-income individuals to protect themselves against the crime focused in the areas they live in. Passing this legislation would be discriminating against these lower income individuals who are actually at a higher risk of being victimized in crimes. To abolish or severely limit the right of the Maryland residents as a whole to bear arms, which is the intent of the proposed legislation, is to essentially defeat the purpose of our own U.S. Constitution. The entire foundation of the United States was formed on the principle that the government, our government, is a government of the people, for the people, by the people, and taking away the people's right to bear arms is taking away the people's power in the government. The Second Amendment, which grants the citizens the right to secure their natural rights, is the backbone of our democratic society. I hope you all consider these points as you go to vote on this or any other gun control bills. They're not trying to get your guns because they really care about kids. These are monster authoritarian scum. Okay? Anybody wants your guns, they want to dominate you and your family, and you know it. My name is Hen Zanong. Forgive me, English is not my first language. I am a legal immigrant, and I am an American by choice. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to express my opinion and give my testimony in opposition to the majority of the proposed bills which do nothing to deter future crimes. Gun control does not work. Your own history is replete with um, high school rifle teams. Boy Scout, marksmanship merit badges. You could buy rifles at the hardware stores. You could order them, mail order, delivered to your home. Your country was awash in readily available firearms and ammunition. And yet, in your past, you did not have mass school shootings. Other people have already expressed the question, what changed? It was not that the availability of guns suddenly exploded or in, in, uh, increased. It actually was decreased. What was changed was societal decay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If gun control actually did work, Washington, D.C. and Chicago would be the safest cities in your nation, but it is not. They have the toughest gun laws and the highest crime and murder rates. Now, um, some people have asked, um, and called the AR-15. They called the AR-15 a weapon of mass killing. Well, it turns out that there are a few government agencies which disagree with that characterization. 
the Department of Homeland Security has stated that a rifle chambered in 556 NATO with a 30-round magazine is suitable for personal defensive use. I have documentation on that. It is HSCEMS-1212-00011, solicitation for the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. Now, who needs an AR-15 with 30-round mags? That question has also been brought up. And I would like to put forward that had the Koreans in the LA riots not had AR-15s and AK-47s with 30-round magazines and Ruger 30s, their businesses would have been burned to the ground like all of the other businesses in their neighborhoods. Theirs stood because they stood their ground. I would also put forward the conjecture that had the 10,000 students at Tiananmen Square not been unarmed, things may not have resulted in so many of them disappearing. In your own laws, United States versus Miller, 309, U.S. 174, 1939, it was made clear that the type of firearms protected by the Second Amendment were those specifically useful and common for military use in defense of the state. I would like to note that the state is not the government. The state is the people. In Lewis, excuse me, Mr. Hans, if you would. In Lewis versus United up. States, 1980, it is stated that the Second Amendment guarantees no right to keep and bear a firearm that does not have some reasonable relationship to the preservation and efficiency of a well-regulated militia. It has nothing to do with hunting. Uh, the militia, as per the debates in the convention, shows plainly enough that it is composed of all males physically capable of acting in concert for common defense. And further, that ordinarily, when called for service, these men were expected to appear, bearing arms supplied by themselves and of a kind in common use at the time. Mr. The AR-15 is the most common and popular rifle in America would at you this please, time. Would you please wrap up? I will wrap up. I would like to wrap up with a statement from Judge Andrew Kuznitsky uh, in Silveria versus Lockyer, uh, 2003. My excellent colleagues have forgotten these bitter lessons of history. The, projects, the prospect of tyranny may not grab the headlines the way vivid stories of gun crime usually do, but few saw the Third Reich coming until it was too late. The Second Amendment is a doomsday provision, one designed only for those exceptionally rare circumstances when all other rights have failed. A free people can only afford to make this mistake once. My name is Bill Stevens. Okay. I live in Newtown. Okay. My fifth grade daughter was in lockdown on December 14, 2012. Unfortunately, her classmate's little sister was murdered in Sandy Hook that day when lockdown and 911 weren't enough to protect her from an evil person. Not protect her from an assault rifle or some type of inanimate object, but from an evil person. Quite different from the elaborate security you all enjoy here at the Capitol. It was fun getting frisks on the way in. I'm not here to cite crime statistics, lives saved with a gun, or the economic impact of the proposed asinine legislation, some of these gun control bills you have proposed. I will, however, read from the Connecticut State Constitution. Section 15 reads very clearly, we all know what the Second Amendment says, but Section 15 in the state constitution says very clearly, every citizen has a right to bear arms in defense of himself and the state. There's no registration, there's no permitting, there's no background checks. It's quite clear. I'm frankly shocked by some of the testimony today. In case some here failed American history, there is something called the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and a process by which to amend it. The same goes for the state constitution. These rights are inalienable and endowed by our creator, not you politicians, to all citizens regardless of gender, race, or creed. In order to limit the rights of individuals, there is something called due process, and legislation is not due process. You want to take my rights away? Let's go to court. And with regards to due process, the final report with all the facts on Sandy Hook will not likely be issued until this summer. It was stated clearly in the newspapers. How can any legislation be passed in good faith or good conscience without all the facts. Again, 
Gun ownership is a constitutional right, but it's not for everyone. That's okay. And shouldn't make gun owners suspects, regardless of how many guns they have or how much ammunition they may have. My guns are not dangerous. They are at home, locked up, collecting dust and cat hair. <laughs> but criminals and tyrants, tyrants especially, beware. Lockdown is not an option at the Stevens residence. And 911 will be dialed after the security of my home has been established. Why is that same security my daughter enjoys at home with her dad not available at school in Newtown? That is what you should be considering, not making her dad a criminal. Charlton Heston made the phrase, from my cold dead hands, famous. And I will tell you here today, you will take my ability to protect my Victoria from my cold dead hands. When freedom shivers in the cold shadow of true peril, it's always the patriots who first hear the call. When loss of liberty is looming as it is now, the siren sounds first in the hearts of freedom's vanguard. The smoke in the air of our Concord bridges and Pearl Harbors is always smelled first by the farmers who come from their simple homes to find the fire and fight. Because they know that sacred stuff resides in that wooden stock and blued steel. Something that gives the most common man the most uncommon of freedoms. When ordinary hands can possess such an extraordinary instrument, that symbolizes the full measure of human dignity and liberty. That's why those five words issue an irresistible call to us all, and we must. <laughs> From my cold, dead hands. Those, you know, crazy crackers on the right, like if they start with their very hateful language. And I just pray that this country and this world repent for the abortions and all the bad things we've done. And I pray that people will open their eyes, but will also put that into action to stand up against evil because it's coming in like a flood. And I pray that the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against it. Please, God, there are so many innocents in this country, and I know we're evil, but the enemy has just gotten us with the television and high-tech systems of control. And I know that we're like dirty rags, but please, please give this country and this world a second chance. Whatever is about to happen, just please, please, please give us a chance like, like Nineveh was given when your prophet Jonah was sent there and, and give us a reprieve if we'll humble ourselves and, and repent. Amen. I mean, that's my simple prayer, ladies and gentlemen, but being this awake is exhausting. I mean, I'll just tell you right now because, and it's frustrating to know how wicked these Democratic Party operatives are, how bad they are how evil they are, how duplicitous, how murderous. My own view is that since the United States is now a police state, I mean, we have the most extensive uh, spying on citizens in human history. It even goes beyond the imagination of George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984. You can't have a police state and an armed population, so there's no doubt they're going to take the guns away. It's absolutely certain, and these kinds of incidents <clears throat> helps them, but they're going to take them away anyhow, because you can't have an armed population in a police state. Now, the trouble with these incidents is that you never really know uh, what happens. Well, if he can, if he can uh, declare that he has the authority to murder American citizens without due process, uh, if he suspects that they might be uh, terrorist in any way connected to terrorist, or if he dis if he declares that he can imprison Americans for life without ever presenting evidence, he can certainly take away the guns. <laughs> he, all he has to do is do it. But Great the point. point there. The point I'm trying to make is we don't really know what happened, and the news reports are inconsistent. Where do we draw the line? Well, Who has the power to say, draw that line? Well, I'm absolutely certain that today the United States 
army killed at least 20 kids in uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, wherever they are. And uh, we don't hear anything about it. It's only if our own kids get killed. Then all of a sudden we get upset. The news is agenda driven. The news is ag agenda driven. And as I've already told you, you cannot have a police state and an armed population. And therefore, they're going to take the guns away. That's absolutely certain. And these events, whether real or not real, are simply helpful in taking the guns away. So the Americans are going to be disarmed. You can't have a police state and an armed population. Do you need a semi-automatic weapon for the only reason i think you need it is pierce challenge alex jones to a boxing match show up with a semi-automatic that you got <laughs> legally and pop him i'd love to see that <laughs> in uniform <laughs> a houston police officer is in custody charged with a crime tonight he's accused of raping a woman while on duty he is charged with aggravated sexual assault we're told he was in uniform when it allegedly happened According to court records obtained by Eyewitness News, while on duty working an accident involving a woman, Carranza forcibly had sex with her in the back of his patrol car. Surveillance video, eyewitness statements, and DNA corroborate her story. No one answered today at the home he shares with his wife and three young girls. West Sacramento police say 37-year-old Sergio Alvarez used his badge and the authority it gave him to control and rape his victims. They say he even sometimes used his patrol car as the scene for his crimes. Um, I'm just appalled and sickened that someone who was put in a position of trust would violate uh, that trust. This was his first job in law enforcement. His neighbors say he is married with three young children. An officer Jackie Neal, a police officer for 11 years, is accused of pulling over a 19-year-old on the south side in his department vehicle. Po police say somehow Neal managed to get the young lady to stand behind his squad car and then attacked her. I am outraged. I, 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 I'm angry. I'm outraged. It's a, it's a, it's a punch in the eye to the police department. An officer caught on video striking the teen in the head oh, with no, his no, gun. No, no. You can see the gun went off. The officer claimed he was assaulted. Oh. Corporal Taylor wrote in his official report that the gun fired as he was being assaulted by dorm and that the teen reached for the officer's gun. As after being jailed for four months, it's painful to watch the video. He's 20 now, angry, and still unnerved by his encounter with police. I heard a shot, and I seen a flash, and I felt something. So I, I thought I was dead, actually. The video shows Ryan smacked in the head, a flash as the gun goes off. Prosecutors say that's contrary to the story Corporal Donald Taylor first told about being assaulted by an aggressive youth resisting arrest. But he made up a story to write false charges against my client. Orion's lawyer says this video came from a surveillance camera on a title store in Brentwood, a couple of blocks from Rhode Island Avenue. It all started late on a wintry evening. The convenience store at the lowest price gas station was open. Well, it was me and my friend. We were just going to the gas station to, to uh, get snacks. Two Prince George's police officers thought the young men looked suspicious, especially Ryan's friend, who was wearing a ski mask. The cops grabbed his friend. Ryan left the store. This officer has not been in jail at all, not spent one day. We watched the video with Ryan and his lawyer, who say police reviewed it two days after the arrest and should have let Ryan go. Uh, you know, I'm trying to walk away from him. You can see you turn around. Yeah, I could, like I said, I could hear footsteps. He never said anything to me. I could hear the footsteps. He's got the gun drawn. Two LAPD officers under investigation stemming from a use of force incident that was caught on tape. A woman was seen being slammed to the ground twice, once while in handcuffs. Pulled over last Tuesday on Foothill Boulevard and Saluda Street for a cell phone violation. 
Watch as Jordan gets out of her vehicle. Moments later, she is slammed to the pavement and handcuffed. The officers pick her up, put her against the patrol car, and pat her down. About a minute and 40 seconds later, the two officers push her down to the ground a second time before pulling her up, putting her in the back seat of the cruiser, and citing her for resisting arrest. What they say is the most egregious, the celebratory gesture of a fist bump afterwards. The simple word is outrage. High Police Chief Charlie Beck is responding with this statement, quote, My initial review of the officer's statements and the recorded video caused me to have serious concerns about this use of force. Just observing. Do you live here? Nope. Turn that off for me. Why do I have to turn it off? I'm perfectly within my legal rights to be able to do this. Turn off the camera for me. I'm perfectly within my legal rights to do this, sir. Listen, turn off the camera for me. No, sir, I, I am in within my legal rights to do this. I do live here. You don't I, I just here, said I live here. Get hey, over here. Hey, Get on the ground. What the hell are you Get doing, down. man? What the hell are you doing? What the hell are you doing, man? On your stomach. Oh, stop resisting! No, 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 Fight again, dude. Your world will hurt, you hear me? One more unit, unit 1728. Shut up. You're not in charge here, buddy. You hear me? This is my property. Well, oh, yeah, buddy. Hey, when you, don't, uh, when you don't do what I ask you to do, then you're in a world of hurt. Then you're in a world of hurt, aren't you? Huh? You're looking at some monsters, let me tell you. And then they have, I mean, I picked up a law enforcement magazine at a 7-Eleven 13 years ago, back in 99. I read it on air. And it was a whole scenario for police about do you torture a terrorist son to, to find out where the anthrax bombs are that are going to go off in New York. And the, the intelligence operative teaches the SWAT team guys, the SWAT team magazine, teaches them, yes, you do. The end justifies the means. I mean, just pure twist your mind. And cops out there all listening going, yeah, I've seen that. I've heard that. Because I see that about a third of the time. I just randomly pick up a law enforcement magazine and just open it. It's just pure evil. Page after page of just absolute evil. The New World Order hates you a lot more than they hate the Arabs and the Muslims. Good old boys, you are the number one terrorist. That's what they're training for, is to take your gun and put you in a forced labor camp. Okay, they'd like to do that. That's on record. So get that through your brain real good. And military and all you CIA people and black ops folks, you're all going to be killed later. You're going to be long knife, night of the long knives. 
You are the biggest chump idiots there are. I mean, I've seen all these guys with their, you know, the, the little goatees and the shaved heads and walking around like they're all tough and evil. You're not evil. You're dead. And you're going to hell. How's that, losers? You cozied up to Satan. Unless you hit your knees and repent to God, you're pathetic. Real men would stand up for justice and stand up against evil and stand up against the psyops. Believe me, when you go before God, he's going to say, I know you not. I know a lot of you, though, you're, you're, you're into evil, aren't you? And you, you don't think there's a God, do you? But deep down, you know there is. You know why you know there is? Because you've got a personal relationship with Satan. And so you know there's the other side of that equation, don't you? Yeah, you know. You know you're scared, and you should be. And you will be a lot more scared. So I suggest if there's any humanity left in you, and any, any touch of God left in your soul before the door is fully closed to you, that you understand that you're fools and that you've been deceived. I mean, you guys, they, they, they trained you to kill innocent Muslims, over a million of them, and trained you to do all this evil, and most of them come home, get all drugged out, commit suicide, they're so depressed about it. But the rest of you guys get off on it, and now the script is flipped, and you just like to kill people. You like it. And that's because you're damned to hell. Not me. I'm not part of any of this, and my soul is not in your end of the ball field, okay? I just want that on record. Not in my name. I'm not involved in this. And everybody else better decide what side they're on. Everybody else better decide what they're going to stand with for eternity. Let me tell you something right now, folks. Stuff's going to get real serious in this country and real serious worldwide real fast. And if you're not right with God, I feel sorry for you. Now, most of the military's waking up, but they don't care. The globalists just throw you out, list you as mentally ill, try to inject you with deadly shots when you go to the VA. All their little frontline ponies get taken care of. But I just want that clear to all of you out there that think you're winning. You're not winning nothing. You're 30 years old and serving the New World Order for a decade, think you're real tough, think you're on the winning team. You're going to be 60 before you know it. And then the shadows are going to be creeping across the floor at midnight when you wake up. Oh, you think I mean people coming to kill you? No, I mean the shadows that really matter. The dramatic scene played out in front of our cameras. Parents grabbing their children and running after spending the night hunkering in their houses and then finding themselves face to face with the muzzle of a SWAT officer's rifle. They broke down one door and then took the people cowering in the house next door out with their hands on their heads. Each time the SWAT team would rescue a family at the point of a gun, they would rush into the home in an armored line, guns at the ready, in case the suspect was hiding inside. And each time they cleared out a resident, they did it with a force that reflected the uncertainty of not knowing who was a friend and who was a foe. And he banged on the door. I looked up. I was shocked. And there was a gun or two guns or whatever pointing down at me. What a vile lie. There were no tanks and there were no police pointing their weapons at innocent citizens. The pattern was dramatically repeated time and again, house after house. But finally, it became apparent all the families were out of their homes and the suspect was not inside. Would you confiscate guns if given federal orders to do so? Uh, you're asking me hypothetically. Yes, that's not going right. there. Would you? Again, I, I can't uh, even begin to guess what I would do as far as the hypo hypothetical situation you're speaking of. I haven't been given an order like that. So. Okay, so I was in a briefing with uh, FEMA. FEMA runs my old unit. I'm actually out now. I got out in September of this year. Uh, they were talking about suspension of the Constitution, Second and Fourth Amendment rights being taken away, and I openly asked them, uh, are we going to take guns? He says no, but he says they will. It's clearly on the video. They will. Talking about the FEMA guys with us. Yeah, pretty much at that time, you're a All your rights, first of all, everything is just, he's not that moment. So you said that uh, martial law suspends their Second Amendment, so would, I'm not going to, but would you say we would take weapons from people? Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah. That's what they do, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying... Yes, I wouldn't agree with that either. I'm a second I live in the Second Amendment. But okay. the sense of being a moment of martial law, you've lost all control. What am I saying? The military, when the military moves in on your street, 
they are now saying you have no more rights unless you're going inside your house. That's like the worst case scenario. So I'm saying when the, the way they're not looking at it, when the guard is used, that's how it's going to be used. No, you're not going to go knocking on doors and be like, all right, I need a shotgun. You're not going like, to go up to each house and say... Well, they did that in Katrina is why I'm asking. And if we're no. talking about shit hitting the fan, no. I'm not going to do it. But They're not going to do that necessarily. Well, it's more or less like, hey, go in your house. Shut up, stay there. That, that's going to be the point. Okay. Because the reason I have marked the law in place is it's a low situation. Like I said, everything's already broken down. You're, you're, there's, it's a last resort to change pretty much... Your last ditch effort to put that in order into that community. That's why they have an actual car. Okay. Good question. They did that in the theater, right? They did go and take what people have done. Yeah. Which I think is bullshit, but. Do you claim you're right to the private people? For those that still have that slight hesitation in the back of their head that gun confiscation can't and won't happen here, it already has. I was only 21 years old, just really gung-ho, really dedicated to the Army, especially to the infantry, and uh, I did whatever I was told. A lot of people may think that they'll see this on the news. It's a truck, you know what I mean? It's a group of trucks. They pull up, they stack right on your home, as we did, and we broke entry. Yeah, we would yell out, Oklahoma Army National Guard, is anybody in need of assistance? But that's as we were booting in the door. But how, how did you and your team justify to yourselves and each other that gun confiscation would help this situation when it was a free-for-all? I mean, isn't that yeah. a time when citizens need to be able to defend themselves? You know, like I said, I was just ignorant as hell. And that's kind of something that I worry about with the, with the kids today, you know, if they really realize what they're doing. You know, I, I had no idea. The only time it ever occurred to me that something may be wrong is we came up, uh, we were down by the old French district. We came up to this man's house. He had a big wooden sign that says, I'm here alone uh, with my dog and my shotgun. Looters beware. We thought, you know, it's funny. Everyone stopped and took pictures of the sign. But eventually we took his guns Jeez. and we left him there with nothing. What would you advise people to do if this happens again? What do you do when they stack right, you know what I mean? And they're prepped to come into the home. There's no negotiating with us, trust me. You, if you resisted, you died. That were the orders. I just hope that the members of the military say no. They refuse to, to engage in gun confiscation. The guns will be taken. No one will be able to be armed. We yes, will sir. take all weapons. Yes, I do whatever I, do whatever I was told. told. If you resisted, you, resist, you died. Die, die. That were the that orders. orders. I do whatever I, do whatever I was told. I was told. If you resist, you, you die. die, die, die. That for the that orders. orders. Go, mount up. American forces are here to help. Remain calm. We will not tolerate civil disobedience. Attention, attention, attention. American forces are here to help. Every member of the SS was told to pride themselves on their hardness and lack of pity.
What if the Constitution was amended stealthily, not by constitutional amendments duly ratified by the states, but by the constant and persistent expansion of the federal government's role in our lives? What if the president assumed that everything he did was legal just because he's the president? What if he could kill you without warning? What if you needed a license from the government to speak, to assemble, or to protest against the government? What if the government didn't like what you planned to say and so it didn't give you the license? What if the right to keep and bear arms only applied to the government? What if the government considered the military an adequate dispenser of domestic law enforcement? What if cops looked and acted like troops and you couldn't distinguish the military from the police? What if you were not secure in your person, in your papers, and in your property? What if the government could decide when you were and were not entitled to a jury trial? What if the government could take your property whenever it wanted? What if the government could continue prosecuting you until it got the verdict it wanted? What if the government could force you to testify against yourself simply by labeling you a domestic terrorist? What if the government could torture you until you said what the government wanted to hear? What if the government tortured your children to get to you? What if government judges and government lawyers intimidated juries into convicting the innocent? What if the government could send you to your death and your innocence meant nothing so long as the government's procedures were followed? What if the people had no rights except those the government chose to let them have? What if voting didn't mean anything anymore because both political parties stand for big government? What if the government was the reason we don't have a constitution anymore? What if you could love your country but hate what the government has done to it? What if sometimes, to love your country, you had to alter or abolish the government? What if it is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong? What if it is better to perish fighting for freedom than to live as a slave? What if freedom's greatest hour of danger is now? Kent State, Ruby Ridge, Waco, Hurricane Katrina, Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious. How many more? How many more false flags? How many more? How many more? How many more? What has been the number one cause of unnatural death in history? Democide, or death by government, has killed 290 million people on record. 290 million people killed. Killed. 290 million. Killed by government. The government. The number one killer in history is democide. 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 Death by government. Go look it up. In the 20th century, Government murdered four times as many people as were killed in all the international and domestic wars combined. USSR, 61,911,000 people killed. Hitler's Germany, nearly 21 million people killed. Japan's imperialism, nearly 6 million people killed. Western colonization killed over 50 million people. Pol Pot's Cambodia, funded by the U.S. government. Two million people killed. China's Communist Party, as many as 76 million people killed between 1949 and 1987. And the list goes on and on. So now you know the most dangerous thing to you and your family in the world is government. Because mass murderers agree, gun control works. Disarming citizens is democide. Disarming citizens is democide. How many people have died because of Fast and Furious? No more false flags. Enough. Enough. It's enough. Now is the time. It's time. It's time to realize that when the government takes your guns, people die. It's time to realize the biggest threat to you and your family is government. It's time to recognize government is the greatest killer of all time. It's time. As an American. As an American. As an American citizen. As a patriot. For your children. Demand to know why you and your children are forced into gun-free zones while government officials, celebrities, and their children 
are protected by armed guards. Demand they show you the word hunting in the Second Amendment. Demand to know why the government shipped thousands of guns to Mexican drug cartels. Demand that our troops stop protecting opium fields in Afghanistan and come home. Demand the government stop this phony drug war. Demand to know why the Department of Homeland Security bought more than 1.6 billion hollow point bullets with our money. Demand our government stop poisoning our food supply with genetically modified organisms. Demand that President Obama stops killing innocent women and children all around the world with his illegal drone attacks. Demand an end to these unconstitutional wars. Demand that the TSA stop groping our genitals at the airport. Demand that the NSA stop illegally spying on all of us all the time. Demand that toxic fluoride be removed from the water supply. Demand our politicians uphold the Constitution and Bill of Rights as they swore to when they took office. It's time. It's time for our leaders to act like leaders. It's time for our leaders to read the Constitution. It's time for our leaders to obey the Constitution. The Constitution. The Constitution. Because a well-regulated militia with 10-round magazines wouldn't last very long. Demand an end to citizen disarmament. Government-sponsored terror. And democide. Democide. Death by government. Right now. Right now. Right now. We are sick and tired of our tyrannical government taking away our rights. Stop stealing our rights. Our rights. Our rights. Enough. Enough. Enough already. Enough. 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 Enough of the people laying down and letting government kill them in mass after disarming them as they've done throughout history over and over again. Enough, enough to laying down and letting these criminals use us up like slaves.